Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Kenny Vaughn. He's going to talk about recording with Lee Von Helm. No, I worked with Lee Von on a record. This friend of mine uh, has a, he's a really good engineer and a, a good songwriter and a good producer, really good. But uh, he wanted to make a record, and um, he decided that he was going to hire Lee Von to play drums. That's what he wanted. And um, I think on bass we had... A couple of days we had Dave Jakes on bass, and a couple of days we had uh, Gary Talent on bass. But I, I'll never forget the first day, you know, I, met, I meet Levon, you know, and I, hey man, you know, he was real nice, you know, just a good old boy, you know. And he was a pothead, big time. He just had cancer, throat surgery, you know, and he's like, you know, just puffing massive amounts of weed all day long, you know. And uh, I got contact high just being around him, you know. It was so strong. But anyway, um, we sat down, and uh, for whatever reason, I was in the studio. Oh, I was positioned right looking square at him about five feet away, you know. With I got my headphones on, and I'm looking at Levon, you know. And so we were, we're running the first tune. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm working and I'm looking at my chart, you know, and I look up at Levon, and he's like, and I just look at it, and it hit me, you know. I said, that's Levon Helm. You know, it's like he became Levon Helm. You know, he, he's like this, this weird little redneck dude, you know, and then all of a sudden he's Levon Helm when he picks up the sticks and starts playing. I was like, wow, it was awesome. And all week it was like that. It was just so much fun just to, you know, count off a song and start playing, you know. It was so good. He had a sound, you know. I was talking to a drummer friend of mine, you know, just today, um, this morning about, I grew up in the age where drummers had sounds. Like, Charlie had a sound, right? Ringo had a sound. John Dinsmore had a sound. You know, uh, uh, I cited a lot of different, we talked about a lot of different cats like that. Mitch Mitchell had a sound, you know. Um, Levon had a sound. You didn't have, you knew it was Levon when you heard him, you know? Yeah. You know? And um, they all played differently than each other. They sound, all sounded different. They didn't sound like, you know, nobody else sounded like Levon. Nobody sounded like Mitch Mitchell. Mitch Mitchell kind of sounded like Elvin Jones, but, you know, and, but he did his own thing with it, you know? And um, Mick Fleetwood. There was another one. Nobody sounded like Mick Fleetwood. He had this certain thing. Even though he's playing very simply, he had a thing, man. He had a sound identity, a footprint, you know? And um, I kind of missed that. You could be in a session and just say Mick Fleetwood and the drummer would change gears. know what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. Yesterday I was in a session and the producer said, uh, um, leave on. That's all he said to mm -hmm. the drummer. He changed his kick, his kick drum pattern. Mm -hmm. You know, immediately, yeah. everybody knew. Right. It's uh, That's a thing of the past, kind of. You know, it's different now. But back in those days, they were so distinct, you know? I was really fortunate to hang out with him for a week. It was great. We didn't bother him too much about that. We didn't pump him, because he probably gets pumped all the time, you know? He told us, tell us about Bob Dylan or whatever, you know, we didn't, we didn't, we just talked about whatever. Talked about his health more, probably more than anything. And then, then that guy, he flew Garth in to do some overdubs, and that was pretty cool. Hey, talk about an oddball, man. Whoa. The last man standing. I would have guessed him to be the first one to go, you know. But uh, I'm a huge fan of those guys. The first two albums were very prominent everywhere. Everybody had those records, as far as I know. I certainly did. I've been, I read his book recently. It came out a long time ago, Levon's book. That was really good. Oh, man, you learn a lot in there. The Hawks, especially, that's a big part of the book. You know, I didn't realize how uh, popular they were and how much, how much they worked. You know, and they were making a lot of money, doing quite well, really. And, you know, Toronto and working, the, you know, around that area, East Coast kind of thing. 
But uh, yeah, it's a really good book. I saw a thing where he said, I never really thought it was a good idea to have a going out of business concert. <laughs> I thought that was pretty great. I just heard that like last week. For me, it was, uh, you know, the Beano album, you know, the first John Mayall record with Eric Clapton. That was, when we heard that, we were just like, what are we hearing? What in the world? That is awesome. You know, there's like three solos on that record. The, the one on uh, All Your Love. And then uh, the, blue, the blues tune, Have You Heard About My Baby? The solo in that is wicked. Just like over the top. And uh, they do, I think they do Stepping Out on there maybe. or one, There's an instrumental that he does on there that's also really good. It's like, wow, we ne nobody ever heard a guitar sound like that until that. And he was, he, it was uh, because of, he had, um, he had a Marshall amp that he was playing, a, a 50 watt, he had two Marshall amps. He had a 50 watt head and a four, cab, four by 12 cabinet. Then he had the little combo, 50 watt combo with two 12s, an open back. And that's what's on the record, that combo amp. But he refused to turn down because there was no master volume on those amps. So you had to, and he used a, uh, um, a little thing called a range master treble booster, which is basically, basically just a signal booster, really. It doesn't really boost treble as much as it does maybe mid-range or something, but they, they called it a treble booster, but I'm not sure if that was... It didn't really brighten it. It just it would push the front end of the amp and just to distortion. Just gave it get your pickup a little bit more muscle, and um, so he used it for that. I think, he, and he refused to turn down. And the guy, the the engineer, who was kind of famous, was like tearing his hair out. You know, it's like you can't. I can't record you guys. You're too loud. You know, they can't. He says we'll you figure it out because I'm not turning down. And you know, they recorded that album probably in one day or two days, and um, that's why it sounds like that. But until that time, we'd never heard anything like that. Now, you know, Johnny Guitar Watson Records in, from the 50s had some wicked-ass guitar sounds, but they weren't like that. They are more Stratocaster into a tweed amp turned up, which was a little bit more brittle and harsh, but wicked nonetheless. And, and of course, Guitar Slim and um, uh, who else? Uh, Earl King, yeah. They, you know, they were both had great sound and you know, guitar solos on their records. Those cats had real wicked ass sounds. Guitar, guitar Slim had a, a hundred foot guitar cable and he had a valet for his cable. <laughs> we're at, dressed in a tux, you know, that would follow him around the club and, you know, dole it out. He would even walk out into the street to play in New Orleans, you know, like, and he had a horn, like a police siren horn, bolted onto the top of his amp. So he's using the speaker in the Fender amp, but he also jumped it up to the horn that was kind of pointed up, you know, and uh, to make it louder and more brash, more trebly and rude. And uh, that was his trick. But I love the, the fact that, you know, Guitar Slim's dressed in a nice dapper outfit. He's got this guy behind him in a tux with a cable, you know, going out into the street and then winded it back up as he goes to the stage. But really, those guys were the only guys that really sound. And Link Ray had a brash, rude sound. You know, he was, he predated, predated, you know, Eric Clapton, but nobody had that Eric Clapton sound like on that record, man. It was just like, whoa. And then there's a, there's a really good example of them live. Jack Bruce, Huey Flint, Eric Clapton and John Mayle, and they're in a nightclub in England. And it says it's in 66, but actually it's in like the fall of 65. They're playing Stormy Monday, and the, and the recording fades in on Eric's solo. It's the most wicked-ass buddy guy, just frantic, intense guitar solo you ever heard on a blues in your life. It's just, but it's the Marshall and the Les Paul, you know, it's like, wow, it's so good. 
I got to see Cream twice in, oh, yeah. in 68. I saw him in the spring of 68 and the uh, fall of 68. They're good? Yeah, they're really good. The first time especially. And he was playing his SG through two Marshalls. And they were just so good. He sounded so good, man. He was just, he was, he was on fire. And then, you know, by 1970, it was over. He never played like that again. You know, it went from being the greatest thing you ever heard to just kind of like, well, that was nice, you know. <laughs> but it was never like it was, you know, when he was, you know, with John Mayle or Cream. That was the end of that. Boy, he changed the face of popular music, you know. I just didn't go there. You know, a lot of, a lot of people really love all that stuff, and I'm glad they like it, you know. I love Frank Zappa. I had his first album when I was 12 years old, when it came out. And I had his second album when it came out, but we're absolutely free. And We're Only In It For The Money was the third album. I had it. I think everything that he put out till about 1974, I probably had them within the month that they were released, if not sooner, you know. And his guitar playing was just absolutely stellar. The first time I saw him was the Denver Summer Pop Festival in 1969. And uh, it was The Real Mother still. Ian Underwood was there, the horn player, that was married to the Ruth Underwood, who later became the vibes player in the 70s. She played all that um, marimba and vibes stuff. But Ian was there. Motorhead Sherwood was playing sax. Um, Jimmy Carl Black. Jimmy Carl Black. And I think it was Art Tripp on drums, both those guys, two drummers. And um, Don Preston was playing keys. And Bunk Gardner was playing woodwinds. That was the band. And they were great, man. And Oh, Roy Estrada, you know, the bass player who sang all the falsetto stuff. You know, all those uh, 50s R&B things with the falsetto voice. <laughs> and then they would do skits, you know. That, that band did comedy routines and, and bizarre stuff. And Roy would... Um, have you ever seen the thing at the Royal Albert Hall where he, he's singing in this falsetto voice and then he starts laughing and then he starts crying? He's like... He's by himself, you know, at the Royal Albert Hall, and he's like, you know, singing this operatic kind of thing, you know, and then he goes, you know, on stage, this whole, you know, it's just like, what the hell is this, you know? And, uh, and that's the same show where, um, uh, Frank says, and now, ladies and gentlemen, Don Preston will play Louie Louie on the Royal Albert Hall pipe organ. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this massive, you know, yeah, pipe organ so playing Louie Louie. On. Great. We're only in it for the money. Still, my favorite uh, oh, Zappa. That's mostly Frank on on, on all the vocals on that record. I didn't realize that, that it, in, it, until in the last decade. I was like, that's all him. He's singing all the parts, you know? Yeah. I think that Roy's on some, Roy's singing a little bit on there, um, but mostly it's Frank and they, he would use um, uh, the very speed on the tape recorder. You know, he'd speed it up and then record, so, and so his voice would sound lower, and then he would slow it down and sing, and then, then it would speed it up and make his voice sound not like Frank. It would sound like, hey, you know. But that's him doing all that stuff. That's really an ambitious record, you know. There's the orchestral stuff on there that's beautiful. It's all of a sudden, you know, this, all this chaos, and all of a sudden this beautiful orchestral piece comes on just for a second. It's like, wow, listen to that. It's so beautiful. And then, of course, it yeah. goes... You know, he doesn't, he doesn't let you have very much of that. I was in high school. I loved that record, but it had a lot to do with it was funny. Well, yeah. To, to me. And it was later, very funny to my, my, me and my friends. You know, we it helped shape our view of society. You know, a lot of that. Frank Zappa was a big force in our brains, you know, as far as 
look at the way we looked at the world because of his, you know, records and the, the kind of things he was, that subversive kind of stuff he was doing with his lyrics. Yeah. And, um, yeah, he was, he was a very smart guy. In a weird way, it fit in with like the same kid who's buying Zappa records is buying Mad Magazine. Absolutely. That's how I grew up. I grew up on Mad Magazine, you know. I mean, I never missed an issue. That was, that, that was my thing. And, and uh, between Frank Zappa and Mad Magazine, I was ruined. <laughs> <laughs> I was ruined. <laughs> Did you ever get to see him live later in life? I I only saw him, I saw him a whole lot between sixty nine and seventy five, quite a bit, but that was it. I never saw him after seventy five. How big were the audiences? Well, it, big. I always saw him in fairly big. Uh, I think the smallest one I saw was he had Flo and Eddie in the band. It was probably about seventy one, but that was at the Denver University Field House, which wasn't really. It was just a basketball arena, but it was not, it was an old basketball arena, and so it wasn't really, you know, very big. That night he was playing his uh, 335, and somebody was, they, they, somebody threw a frisbee and hit the guitar, and he had to switch back to his SG. He was not very happy about it. I remember he was like, thanks a lot. I, now I can't play the guitar I want to play tonight. Thanks to your frisbee, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, he knew what he was doing. And I love his um, R&B record collection, you know, the stuff that he listened to that no one, I mean that, you know, he and Don Van Vliet, you know, the Captain Beefheart, where they were pals, you know. Yeah. And Zappo used to go over to his house when they were teenagers and he, uh, Captain had a killer record collection and that was all doo-wop R&B. That was what those guys were into. And um, I've looked up some of the stuff that they were listening to. It's really cool. You know, it's like sort of L.A. doo-wop, you know, mostly black, you know, records that probably were regional hits, but not national hits. And there's some cool stuff, man. Really great. You heard that album Ruben and the Jets. Ruben and the Jets was his uh, tribute to that. Okay. And uh, Roy does a lot of falsetto singing on that record. It's, okay. it's a mother's record. Probably about 1970, 71, somewhere around there. It wasn't called Frank's, that was called Ribbon in the Jets. So it pro that's probably why it didn't sell very big. Cause, man, his guitar solos. Whoa. So good. Just the greatest. His note selection is just brilliant, you know. It's amazing. Sounds like, you know, he, he took a lot from Johnny Guitar Watson and uh, Guitar Slim. Those were his two guys. And um, he even had Johnny in his band for a minute, you know, sang uh, San Bernardino, San, Bernard San Bernardino. That's Johnny on that, singing that. And Johnny's a great vocalist. I love Johnny. He's one of my all-time favorites. Have you ever seen him do uh, on that uh, German TV show, called, um, I think it's called Rock Plast. Um, they have Johnny Guitar Watson on, it's in the 70s, and he does Gangster of Love. Yep. Look it up. It'll blow your mind. It's awesome. Just, just punch in on, go to YouTube and punch in Johnny Guitar Watson, German TV, Gangster of Love. That'll get you where you want to be. It is so good. <laughs> Some of the best, some probably the best five minutes of YouTube you're ever gonna see. It's up there at the top of the list. It's so good, man! What a great show. Yeah. You see the Doctor Hook? Oh, you would remember if you've seen it. Oh my God, they are so high, and they are on fire, man. They they just took over that studio, and it's like pirates came in there. <laughs> It's so good. They do all kinds of crazy shit. It's awesome, man. It'll make you think about them different if you watch that. You'll be like, whoa. <laughs> they are beyond high. Man, Frank's songs are cool, man. 
he had some good stuff in there, you know. I mean, every record has good good songs. Yeah. Even the first album, remember that song, uh, You Didn't Try to Call Me? But you didn't try to call me. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And there was another one on there, too, that was like, it could have been a real, you know, like, it could have been cut by a R and b guy, you know. Yeah. And it could possibly have been a hit, you know, with, if it would have been, you know, tamed down a little bit, and you know. He had several like that, you know, it was like, wow. Any way, any way the wind blows? Any way the wind blows, it's all right with me. Yeah. I mean, it's a good tune, man. Mm -hmm. And you could, you could sing that one at a folk club, you know, and it would go over, you know. Man, he was he was a cat. Did you ever hear the John Wayne story? Well, um, you know, they got a gig playing on Sunset Strip, right? Yeah, I think it was the Troubadour or one of those places. I'm, I'm going to say it was the Troubadour, but I'm not sure. But it was those guys that are on the first album. That band, right? It's Roy on bass and Jim on drums. Uh, Elliot Ingber was the other guitar player. Frank played guitar. And um, don't know what else they had. But uh, I've seen pictures of them playing there. You know, it's a go-go place, you know, dance club. And, but they also, you know, but anyway, John Wayne went in there a couple of times. And he was always drunk, of course. John, John Wayne was, he stayed drunk for his whole life, you know. He never was sober. And um, he would go in there with his crew and heckle Frank. And Frank would, you know, heckle him back on the microphone. They'd spar back and forth, you know, between songs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've read an account of it. It's pretty humorous, but I've read several, actually, accounts of, of that happening. I think it happened like twice, maybe, if not more, you know, at least twice when John... They probably would get along pretty good if the, if John Wayne could just get past what Zappa looked like. Yeah, well, he, you know, this would, be, would have been like 65, you know, and those guys didn't look like anybody else in L.A. You know, they, they ragtag bunch of weirdos, you know, you know and uh, dressed funny. Uh, if you ever look at the pictures of what they wore, it's, it's pretty, pretty funny. It's like... Like a bunch of bums imitating a rock band <laughs> 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 or something, you know. It doesn't look quite right. It's like, wow, <laughs> a bunch of freaks. They're great. They were just so good. You know, it was the big concert in uh, the Denver Coliseum where I saw so many shows. Yeah, all my brothers were great. Barry Oakley was there, you know, the whole band. I always found it interesting. Uh, when I played with Lucinda, we opened for the Almonds, and that was when I figured out why Greg always was positioned to one side of the stage, to stage, uh, stage right, is where he always said it, and because he uh, he didn't like monitors. He never used a monitor. He just sang into the microphone, and he had his little Leslie behind him, and he didn't play very loud. And he was far enough from the band to where he could hear him, but he could hear himself sing through the PA and, you know, just, he could sing. And I asked him, I said, you never have used monitors, right? And he said, no, man. He said, you know, I, I came up, when there, were, there weren't monitors when I started, you know. Those things didn't come out till later. And I never could get along with him. I just hated him. <laughs> <laughs> He sang really well, you know, like Ray Charles, man. What a, what a great singer. When you're playing that big of a venue, that big of a PA, can you hear yourself in the house pretty well? Sometimes. Singer? Depends. You know, in that band, I think Dickie had a monitor, but Greg didn't. He just wouldn't have it. They were playing through Marshalls with Lennon's song. Yeah, they still had the Marshalls, which I think was their best sound, you know. Dwayne never had, Dwayne never went to another amp, you know, he was, you know, he probably used, you know, small fenders in the studio, but he used the Marshalls on stage. And, you know, he was dead before they moved on to different gear.
the same gear that's on the cover of uh, the live album. You know, where the out in the out in the back. You know, Is on the, the Fillmore. Yeah, the Fillmore East yeah. thing. Yeah, is that gear? They sounded great, man. So good. And Dickie was really good. You know, I. It was that night that I really, kind of. You know, I went to see Dwayne, but I realized this guy's really good. Yeah, you know, he was. That solo he played on Ramblin' Man, you know, it was great. He was a really good guitar player. I think when I saw him, when we when I saw him with Lucinda, I don't think he lasted much longer than that that period. We that was late '90s. I don't know when he got fired. I'm not sure, but I did see him do business in the lobby of a hotel one day. He was a very unpleasant person to be around, and. Nobody liked him in the band. I know that. You know, they were over it. He was, ex you know, extremely unpleasant fellow. Unfortunately, he was quite talented. Jack Pearson was playing the dates we opened for, and he quit soon after because he couldn't handle Dickie. But I remember well, I watched him every night. Of course, every show we opened, you know, I was. You know, sat on the side of the stage and watched everything. You know, and every time uh, they gave Jack one long solo in the so in the show, and he took it out to outer space every time. It was just beautiful. And I remember every night, you know, Greg would be over there, you know, hair hanging down, you know, just singing into the microphone. You know, he was he was only recently sober, maybe less than maybe a year, and he was still obviously shell-shocked, you know, he was just kind of like, you know, he was still adjusting to sobriety, going through whatever you have to go through. And uh, he was pretty, um, kind of deer in the headlights, kind of. But I remember every time Jack did that solo, I look at, I remember the first time I noticed, Greg is like, he's smiling. That's the only time in the set that Greg smiled was during Jack solo. Every night, I remember I saw him the first night, looking you know, smiling. I was like, oh, okay. And then the next night, I, I, he was smiling again. You know, about halfway through that solo, he was like nodding his head, like, "Yeah, man, <laughs> that was so cool." Is there a video out there, Jack Pearson playing Dwayne's? Uh, Les Paul. I don't know. There might be. I think there probably is. so. I can't imagine that he didn't. I don't think he's. Pl don't think he plays much out these days. No, uh, he's so good. God, Jack's amazing. He's just a wizard, an unbelievable musician. So people don't realize. I remember when I first moved to town. I saw him. I was like, Who the hell is this guy? You know what? You know, and I remember being at a session and saying, have you ever played with Jack Pearson? And the guy was like, yeah, I play with him. You know, he'll never make it. I said, what do you mean? He said, he's just not cut out to be in this business. That might be a compliment in some ways. <laughs> well, I would, I would wear it like a badge of honor, you know, but uh, he should be more famous than he is because he's a wicked guitar player, man. Whew. He goes in places nobody can go. Marty had talked about it for a number of years, wanting to work with Joe Walsh. They apparently ex must have knew, known each other a little bit, you know, somehow. Because Marty knows everybody. You know, we rehearsed the day before the show and booked a rehearsal thing for all the artists we were backing up for the show. And he came in for his little segment. And uh, he had a, a guy that set up his little amp and his pedals and his uh, guitars and then he arrived at the appointed time and and he appeared sort of like you know a little rickety and disheveled and um but he was very nice and he once he put that guitar on he walked around the room to every person and said this is how i want you to play this you know this is exactly what I want you to do on this song. He knew exactly how to take, you know, musicians he's never played with and school them on how to play each number correctly. 
And I thought I had my part down right, and it turned out that I wasn't quite doing it anything like what he did. And he quickly showed me how to do my part. I was like, okay, yeah. And he he didn't really engage with me very much at all, you know. Uh, and then, uh, you know, when he was when he started singing, it was like, wow, because he's you know he's talking like you know, you can barely you know, yeah you know and, you know, and then he starts singing. It's like sounded like the record in 1974 or whatever you know it was like wow you know there it is you know yeah. it's joe walsh and he played great he really really good you know and so uh when we did this show the next night he was just fantastic he came out looking good and he he comes goes from this little old man to being joe walsh you know as soon as he puts on a guitar, he's Joe Walsh. It's amazing, the transformation, you know. Yeah. He seemed very nice, but uh, one good thing happened. Uh, he walked on stage, and he comes up to me, and he whispers in my ear, and he says, man, he, we've been playing already, you know, and he hadn't ever really, he hadn't heard us play until that night, you know, play our stuff, and he's like, dude, you're a motherfucker. <laughs> and that made me feel really good and it kind of loosened me up too because i was a little bit feeling kind of like stiff you know you know when he walked on i was like i hope this goes well and then when he said that to me i was like yeah you know it kind of loosened up a little bit you know and he was so good man really great what songs did you do i don't remember uh probably rocky mountain way and uh James Gang song, Funk 49. No, I don't remember what else. Yeah. Yeah, we did a lot of, we were backing up a lot of people. So I had spent, you know, the week trying to get everybody's stuff down, you know, all the different parts, guitar parts and, you know, sounds and what guitar am I going to play on this and just all that stuff. It's always a hectic week. Yeah. I just used my Marty Stewart rig. He was playing with us, you know, yeah. and he had a, um, uh, a new Vox AC-15 and his guy had a bag of pedals and there was a, a little tiny nano size four pedal that held four pedals and then, and Joe kept switching them out at rehearsal you know like ah oh, that's not right you know and they're all like they weren't fastened to the board at that time they were just sitting there you know and he said yeah that'll work you know I said okay you know and and I was just kind of watching him, like, you know, it, he, you know, they weren't like particularly expensive pedals. They were like those tiny little things, you know, the modern little mini pedals. Yeah. And they were very off the rack, go to any music store kind of stuff, you know, nothing boutique or anything like that. You know, I don't remember what he, he actually used that night, but uh, he sounded great. Did yeah. you ever see him back in the day? No, never did. I was around... Um, I used to, he was living up in uh, Boulder when he quit the James Gang. And I was, I'd been friends with all those Boulder people. Tommy Bolin was a pal of mine, you know. Uh, my band used to open for his band Zephyr back in like 1968. No, it's 69. 69 is when we opened for them quite a bit. So he was a local guy. And he went on to play with, he replaced Joe in the James Gang. And he was, he, Joe recommended that they get him that's how he got the gig and he lived in Boulder and Joe you know when he uh, quit the James gang he went to Boulder and hung out for quite a, I think a year or so and I was just starting to do recording sessions and there was a guy named Dick Darnell who was a really good producer but he was also the studio manager up at uh, Caribou a recording studio so when there wasn't anything booked there, we'd go up there and record sometimes, you know, but, you know, it was just like local people. And um, I knew a lot of guys that knew him, but I never ran into him during that period. But I knew people that played with him and, and you know, hung out with him. And uh, everybody always said he's a great cat, you know. What exactly was this gig where you said there were a lot of people? It was, it was the Marty Stewart Late Night Jam. It happens every year. And there's many guests. And we often are the backup band for quite a few of the artists. Yeah. It was the 20, 21st 
20th anniversary of the late night jam. We've done 20 of them. It always sells out. It's always a big deal. It's the, the whatever they used to call, you know, fanfare became fan fest or and now it's CMA fest or something like that. I don't even know what it's called, but they have it every year. And um, our night is the Wednesday night of the first kind of big night of, of that whole thing. That's so it's always that same night every year, Wednesday of that week. Okay. Yeah. And Joe Walsh was one of the guests that night. Yes, he was. Okay. He was the guest, man. He was Joe Walsh. <laughs> <laughs> he was the man. And the place went nuts when he walked out on stage. It was great. He was really good, man. Now, Eddie, I saw Eddie. Well, I had these uh, heavy metal neighbors. They were younger than me. This is probably about 1980 or 81, I'm guessing, 81, I'll bet. And it was early Van Halen, you know, they hadn't done Jump or anything like that, you know, but they were, they were playing down at the big sports arena. And uh, these two heavy metal kids were, you know, several years younger than me. And I really liked them. And one of them was a pretty good guitar player, you know, and the other guy was a singer. And... Come on, Vaughn. We bought your ticket. You gotta go see Van Halen, man. Come on, man. You gotta go. And I was like, oh, I don't wanna go down and see a heavy metal show. He said, dude, this isn't like a heavy metal show. You gotta go. So I went, you know, and I just couldn't believe what I was hearing or seeing. I could not believe it. I just was stunned how good it was, you know. It's like, that. this guy is from another planet. It was like seeing Charlie Parker. I mean, it was that good. I was, my jaw hit the floor, you know, and I was stunned. I, I really enjoyed the show. It was the only time I ever saw him, but man, whoa. His rhythm playing, his lead playing, it was just unbelievable. You know, and the whole time he's running all over the place, jumping, you know, and and he's never, never makes a mistake or anything and laughing and having a good time, you know, you know, I couldn't believe it. His rhythm players, his rhythm playing swings way more than you expected. Oh, yeah, man. He moves that. Well, you know, he and his brother, the drummer, you know, they're just, it seems like, you know, they've got their own rhythm that they're locked into each other, you know? They just, they're brothers, you know? Yeah. You know, Eddie was the drummer originally, and his, uh, he played keyboards and, and drums, and then he got a guitar and started playing guitar. Did, uh, was Dave, like, super entertaining? No, oh, he's hilarious. Like P.T. Barnum, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he's the ringmaster. He's funny. He's really funny. It made me laugh. And, and, and he also reminded me of Jim Dandy quite a bit because he had the same outfit, you know, the white bell bottoms, no shirt, you know, maybe a vest, you know, but no shirt, you know, that whole, you know, the same kind of hair, same kind of boisterous personality, out over the top, yeah. clown, you know. And Jim Dandy had done that quite well, I thought, you know, in Black Oak, Arkansas. He, really, he was a great front man. On David Lee Ross' podcast, the theme he chose was from a band called The Fuglies from Indianapolis, Indiana. They're buddies of mine. Wow. And they wrote this song called, Where's David Lee Roth? We need him now more than ever. Oh, like cool. He's a superhero. Uh, and out of nowhere, David Lee Roth uses that as the theme of his... Uh, that's great. And Andy, who wrote it, is a very popular, successful comic book artist. So I cool. want to say that on the camera so that people will go look him up. Andy, What's his name? Andy Kuhn. Andy K-U-H-N. Kuhn. K-U-H-N. Beautiful okay. guy, too. Cool. Are Excellent. there any Nashville connections to any of the Van Halen universe? Yeah. Um, there's a place called... Uh, there's a the, pl the one place in town where you get road cases built for your amps and, and equipment. It's called Mental Case, and that's their old road roadie runs that company. Yeah. I can't think of his name, but he's a character. He was a Van Halen's roadie for the whole thing. <laughs> wow. And um, he's a big personality. He's but his, his company's Mental Case, and it's a, that's where you go if you want to 
you know, anvil fly case for your Fender amp or for your Marshall amp or for your keyboard or whatever, you know, they'll make anything. It's exactly what you would expect. <laughs> <laughs> he went through the war <laughs> can you imagine what that must have been like the first time I remember being around him was uh, in the 80s at um, a place called the Cannery and we were filming a TV show there uh, one of those live TV shows where CMT, early CMT I don't know what, how to put this it was you know at that time, that was during the great credibility scare, you know, when Steve Earle was at the top of the charts, Lyle Lovett was having hits, you know, up in the top five of country music, um, Nancy Griffith, the O'Kanes, people like that. And I was working with the Sweethearts of the Rodeo. We were doing a TV show down at the cannery. I don't remember what it was, but it was the kind of thing where you play, you know, like a half hour set. You know, and and they taped John Prine the same day we did, and I that was the first time I saw him in person, and he had his uh, wife playing bass. Can't remember who else was playing with him that day, but it was, you know, a five piece band. I think it was kind of the tail end of that part of his career where he had a band like that, you know, and then he scaled back and uh, went back to playing more quiet, more like folky, you know which I think really fit him, his sound a lot better, you know. And he did, eventually he did hire drummers again. And I know Paul Griffith played with him for a while. And Dave Jakes played bass for him for 25 years. The last 25 years. And we were on the last show he ever played. Really? Yeah, well, it was New Year's Eve and at the Opry House, and we opened for him. What do you remember about that show? Him, him dancing uh, off the stage. Lake Murray. Yeah. And the audience singing along. And he started one engine on the stage and did this little dance and went, danced all across the stage and out the back, you know. That's what I remember the most. And I also remember, I think it might have been Lucas Nelson. I could be wrong. I think it was Lucas got up and did something with him. I don't think I ever played with him. No. I can't remember. We, I knew him, you know. I played a lot of shows where we opened for him uh, with uh, R.B. Morris. Uh, sometimes it was just me and R.B. as a duo. Sometimes it was me and R.B. And at one time, uh, I know we uh, we borrowed Dave Jakes because he was our bass player normally. We, we had a band for like 15 years with the same five guys, R.B. Morris band, and Dave was the bass player in that band, and Paul Griffith played drums, but. And we went to the bar afterwards, of course. John was great at the bar. That's when I first met him, actually. Now I remember. It was in 1987. When I came to town, I used to hang out at the Bluebird. Back in those days, the Bluebird would bring in national acts all the time. And so you'd see all kinds of music there. I remember one night, I was, I was you know, it's like a week night and I had the Nashville scene and uh, no, the, the the Tennessean now, uh, on Sundays the Tennessean would had this uh, fold out magazine kind of thing that had every club in Nashville listed and every single day you know that for this that week you know for the, all the shows that week were listed you know and you know you look at the Blueberry Cafe Monday so and so Tuesday so and so so I looked and it was so Joe Clay, I was like, Joe Clay? He, he, did, he had a single called Don't Mess With My Ducktail. It was a rockabilly hit. Don't mess with my ducktail, I get so mad at you. <laughs> it was a really good <laughs> record, excellent record. You know, I was like, it can't be the same Joe Clay, you know, because it seemed like ancient history to me. You know, this record probably would have come out in the late 50s, and this was in 1987. You know, that's 30 years ago, you know, yeah. and um, I was like, so I was sitting at my house, you know, about 730 and I thought, I'm going over there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and Amy, the lady that ran the Bluebird, she, I was over there so much that she just let me come in the back door and I didn't have to pay. So I thought, well, well I got nothing to lose. So I drove over there. 
I walk in and they introduced him and it was Joe fucking Clay. But the reason I'm telling you this is because uh, Amy would always um, close the place and then she'd let certain people stay in and drink. And it was always Fred Novlock, uh, Mark Germino, Steve Earl, Towns Van Zant, and John Prine. And she'd let me hang out with those guys. So I'd be sitting on the edge of the bar, you know, and I wouldn't say a word. I would just, you know, sipping my whiskey or whatever, and these guys would be smoking cigarettes and talking. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and me. I hadn't, they didn't know me from Adam, you know? They came to sort of, you know, and John and I sort of, he, he remembered me every time he saw me, you know, hey Kenny, how you doing? And Mark Germino uh, would, you know, remember me. I played on his last album uh, that he made a couple of years ago. It's really good. But uh, that was how I got to know John, was at late night, at after hours at the Bluebird. Oh yeah, his band was always the sweetest guys in the world. Every, every, there was never any, he always hired people he liked to hang out with. You know, that, that's how he hired people, you know. The, he had to play good, but he wanted to be able to go to the bar with you afterwards and have a good time without getting wild or anything. You know, he wasn't a wild guy. But he liked, he had to have a cocktail, and, you know. He liked, to, uh, he liked to listen to people more than he'd talk, really. He was always just sit there and listen to those guys talk and laugh, you know. He had this, he like, had this grin on his face and taking it all in. Usually it was Fred, Noblock, and Steve Earle were talking the most. And Towns, I never saw him drunk. Even though he was drinking, I never saw him drunk. He was just this quiet, nice pleasant fellow. And then when I saw the movie about him, I was like, whoa, you know? <laughs> I went to his house one time, there was this young girl that used to hang around the gigs I played. And she would always come to our gigs and stuff. And one night, um, she, I, she had to be what? She had to have a fake IRD or something. She couldn't have been older than 18 or 19 years old, you know? She lived, she was living out at Town's place and uh, she asked me for a ride home. So I said, okay, I'll give you a ride home, you know. So I drove her over to Town's place and I had to use the restroom and I went in his little place he was living there. It's like, whoa. You know, I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't pretty. I don't remember him ever being anything but kind, you know, and, and a smile on his face and seemed like he just was enjoying every moment of life, you know. <laughs> At one time, he said to Marty Stewart, um, you know, Marty, I got this thing figured out. If I need a new refrigerator, I drive to Kansas City and play a show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I heard him say that. I was like, that's great. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> that's the life in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I, yeah, I saw him up, up in New York City one time. He uh, started at Fat Tuesdays, and then he moved over to a place called the Iridium, I think. I never saw him at the Iridium. I was going to go one night, and... Um, I'd been working all day in the studio. I was too tired because I had to go back and work all day the next day. And I was like, I ain't going. I wish I would have gone now, but I didn't. Did he still have his chops when you saw him? Yeah, the, I saw him Fat Tuesdays, and that was late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, he was, he was on fire. Yeah. He still played really well. And, and I, oh, and I saw him at Nashville Now. I saw him then, too. Uh, there used to be a show on TNN. It was a 90-minute music program, five days a week in the afternoon. Ralph Emery was the host. It was called Nashville Now, and they had country acts on, you know, for 90 minutes, interview on the couch and all that stuff. And a friend of mine, uh, the guy who started that band, Low Straight Jackets, was uh, his name's Danny Amos. He was working there you know, on the floor. He was a, a floor director or something like that. And uh, he calls me up and he says. What are you doing? I said, I don't know, hanging out. You know, it was one morning. He said, you better get down here because 
Les Paul, um, Chad Atkins is the guest host, Ralph's not here, and Les Paul is his guest. I said, I'll be there. So I go down, he left my name at the back door, I'd played the show many times at that time, and um, I walked in the back door and, and um, Les Paul was, had rented a, a twin reverb from SIR Rentals, had that sent over. And he shows up with his guitar and he plugs in, no effect or anything, you know, and he's playing, just burning, you know, playing really great stuff. And I'm standing there watching him. And he, and he says to the guy running the monitors, he said, listen, I need, um, I was, you know, I can't remember what the millisecond was, you know, 80.1 millisecond <laughs> delay with two slapbacks and uh, on my microphone and coming through my monitor, you know. So my, my, mic my amp and then put that through the delay and then give it back to me through my monitor. And that's, he got the echoplex sound, you know, the slapback sound. And he played for a second. He said, yeah, that's okay. A little bit less. Okay, perfect. And that was his sound check, you know. And, uh, and, and less, I mean, Chet Atkins was playing one of these horrible solid body acoustic guitars that Gibson was making. He'd switched from Gretsch to Gibson guitars. And they were making like a, a nylon string solid body, a steel string solid body, and uh, two electrics, and four different models. Gibson was manufacturing for Chet. And uh, well, you know, they, he was, they put his name on it, you know. And, and I think there was an electric Stratocaster kind of thing too that they made. It was god awful. It was a to horrible. And um, he's, I had one of those uh, country gentlemen Gibsons, and it was terrible guitars. <laughs> horrible. I got it for free, but it was, it was it was terrible. But anyway, they're up there playing on the TV show, <laughs> and uh, you know they. Have you ever listened to those Chester and Lester records? Yes. You know they talk a lot while they're playing. You know. And, and uh, Lester's just burning, just killing it, you know, and, and Chad's playing this solid body electric steel string acoustic kind of thing. And, um, and Les says, well, you've been practicing while Chad's trying to play, you know, <laughs> you know, and it didn't sound really good, you know, it's like, why is he playing that guitar? You know, and, and, he, and he points to the headstock, he says, well, at least you finally got a decent guitar. You know, because, you know, Gibson, you know. <laughs> 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 right you know, he was like, yeah, they're all buddies, so they're, I'm sure Chet knew he, what he was in for, but <laughs> less, less Paul heckling you while you're trying to play, you know. <laughs> it's great, though. That'd be bad enough. You know. Man, he was good that day. Whoa. He was on fire. There's a story about him. On the, you know, he lived down, down in New Jersey, and um, maybe he's always going up to New York City for, for whatever reason, you know. He's coming home on the New Jersey, New Jersey Turnpike one night late, and he's speeding. He gets pulled over by a cop, and um, he rolls down his window, and he says, you know, he's talking to the officer, and he says, hey, do you play guitar? And... Uh, the guy says, yeah, I do. He says, I'll bet my name's on your guitar. And he goes and opens the trunk and says, is it this kind? He you know, has a Les Paul model in the, with his name up on the, you know, it's up on that uh, you know, headstock. It's a Les Paul model, you know. And the guy apparently did. And he's like, let him go. Now, I don't know if that's a true story or not, but <laughs> he always told that story, so I don't know if it's true. Man, I had to sell, I had a 55 Les Paul with two P90s that I acquired, and it was my favorite guitar I ever had, but I had to sell it because I needed money. It was so sad. How much did you get it for? I think I paid um, probably around I traded into it, so I probably had about four thousand five hundred bucks, roughly, into it, and I sold it for seven grand. So, you know, what would it be worth now? I don't know. It was, it. What was the deal with that guitar? The the uh, 
the wiring harness had been robbed out of it and replaced with modern wiring. So that devalued it quite a bit. That was the, that's why I was able to own it, because the wiring harness was gone. Because those things are worth a lot of money. Just the, the, the four you know, potentiometers, the switch, and the wire. Just that is worth a lot. And um, somebody more of it and replaced it with modern stuff. But it still sounded good because the pickups were still the same pickups. So the original pickups. I got it from Gruen, so he knew. And he gave me a good deal. You know, Gibson guitars, Gibson electric guitars from 1948 to 1969 really are infallible. They're, you know, they're just, they were so well made. And they used really good wood that had been sitting there aging for years. You know, they had a big, big ass supply of wood that was in the warehouse drying out. And back in those days, it was easier to get old wood. Just the, the trees were old. And then they would age them for, you know, they, some of that wood apparently had been sitting in the Gibson drying, you know, wherever they kept the lumber for 30 years, you know. And when the guitar boom happened, they went, they, they kind of used it all up. So by the late 60s, they started using greener wood. And that was a problem. And the guys who were doing the fret work from, you know, the 30s to the end of the 60s were the best. I mean, the best frets ever. They're, they're, they're next for the best. Gibson guitars are the best, you know. They're, they're, if you're a jazz player, what are you gonna play? You know? You gotta play a Gibson, man. Arch top or whatever, you know? But that's, that was the thing. And I don't know why, why they're so good. They just were, really were. Um, I remember uh, when we were recording at Mike Campbell's studio, and um, he has a 59 Les Paul, you know, the Holy Grail. And I had my amp there, and he went and got it, and plugs it into my amp and hands it to me. And, uh, he says, turn up and play it. And I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> you know, that sound. It was like, you can't get that sound anywhere else. It's like a new Les Paul, built exactly the same way. I mean, scientifically, they can get really close, but they can't get that certain extra little something. There's this thing, it's like this thick sort of unbelievably rich sound that comes out of those things, those, like the 58 and the 59. Those two years are like crazy good, man. I don't know why, and the 57, some of them sound really good. and I. I've talked to people that say they played 59s that didn't sound good, and I believe that, you know, but everyone I played was amazing. It's something extra there, man, is the reason that everybody plays guitar, you know? I mean, Jeff Beck, where did he get his sound? Les Paul and Bo Diddley. Those were his two biggest influences, you know? So you got Bo Diddley's mumbling guitar, yeah. you know, that's Jeff Beck. That's, that's, you know, like he, he did that on uh, the end of um, uh, their version of the studio version of I'm a Man off of Having a Rave Up with the Yardbirds at the end of the song where he goes and just like muted the strings and just, just sound like a locomotive. That's a Bo Diddley thing, you know, mumbling guitar. And, uh, when he, even when he was in the Tridents, um, he was doing the Bo Diddley thing, making noises and barnyard noises and all that kind of stuff on the guitar. And, uh, but his other thing was Les Paul, you know. He sounded exactly like Les Paul on, on Beck's Boogie, Jeff's Boogie, I think it's called. You know, that's Les Paul. That's what he, everything on that cut is Les Paul. That's what he was doing, you know. You know, Les Paul was a Django Reinhardt fan, obviously. He, was, he got a lot from that, you know, he was kind of took that and ran with it. But, you know, he was working with George Barnes in Chicago, who was a fabulous jazz guitar player. They had a duo. And I'm, I'm sure he, George must have influenced him a lot as well. But man, that guy was a genius. 
one of the first guys to try to figure out how to make a better way of amplifying the guitar. Gibson had its uh, ES-150 that Charlie Christian played. Charlie was a big influence on Les. He, was, he influenced everybody, you know. Between Django Reinhardt and Charlie Christian, that was pretty much all Les needed to hear. You know, he kind of combined those two and became Les Paul. But his, you know, his, he was never happy with the, electric, the hollow body electric guitars. You know, once you got to a certain volume, it became problematic. And he didn't want to have to deal with that, so he was always messing around with pickups and solid bodies and stuff. And when Gibson approached him, he was glad. And he gave them a way less input than people think they did. You know, he, he took credit where that should have gone to Ted McCarty, the head of Gibson. Because he only had a few demands that, and they, like, having the pickups as deep into the body as he could get it was one of his first things. And uh, the first year or two, the first two years of the Les Paul that was built like that, but then they changed the design to get rid of the trapeze bridge. and. Uh, that's when they sort of moved away from that, having to pick up so deep in the body because they had to raise them up a little bit to get a better break over the bridge and change the neck angle of the guitar. The way, the way the neck was glued into the body at a, different, a steeper angle so you can get more height over the, the bridge was higher and um, that kind of fixed the problem. But really he took credit for that guitar more than he deserved, really. His name's on it. But he was very dissatisfied with the pickups, always, and he made his own pickups and put him... What Gibson would do, they'd send him guitars with no pickups, and he'd rat them out and to fit his whatever design he'd been working on, and he wound up using low impedance pickups because he wanted a cleaner sound. He wanted to be able to plug right into his Ampex tape deck direct without using an amp or a mic or anything and uh, nobody else was doing anything like that nobody really those pickups never caught on Les Paul used those from the in the, even in the 50s he was using those things and that Gibson put out this Les Paul recording and a Les Paul professional model that went nowhere uh, because they were low impedance pickups and you couldn't get them to sound like a rock and roll record you know like a Les Paul that everybody else played with the humbuckers, you know. Was that an XLR? Yeah. Jagged? Yeah, I do believe one of the models did, yeah. But he'd moved, that was his thing, you know. He wanted that clean crystal zingy sound. And um, But man, those records he made with his wife were just him and his wife. And it's like, you know, 15 guitars. Yeah, I was at the Library of Congress and um, they let us go in the, down in the, it's not the one in D.C., but at the, the, the secret place where they keep all the stuff. It's, a, it's underground, and you have to go through security and all this stuff. But this guy took us down there with Marty Stewart, and we went into the, I mean, there's so much stuff there. I mean, you have every movie ever made, you know. You can't go in those rooms because they, they, those guys are wearing like space suits and everything, you know, and like the climate control and they're keeping the dirt out and all that stuff it's to preserve the film, you know. And um, but there was this guy who had a, a Pro Tools rig and he had he had been in the process of transferring every Les Paul, you know, those early recordings were made before the tape. So they were, you know, uh, I guess a lathe. So he had two of them, so he could bounce from one to the other, back and forth, you know. And he would, you know, start off, and he, so the guy had gone through, and they had all these stacks of, like, these discs, you know, that he'd cut. And just for one song would have, like, you know, 25, you know, of discs. And he had put them all in, dumped them all into Pro Tools for each song. And he would, you know, well, here's the drum sound. It's this less making a drum sound on his guitar, you know. And then 
here's the bass sound. It's just less playing a, like a bass, you know, part on the guitar. And it's all these different sounds in the guitar and then all the vocal tracks of his wife, all those harmonies, you know, background harmonies. And, you know, it's probably 10 of her and 15, 20 guitars, you know, whatever. And we sat there and listened to a couple of, you know, he just went different, tri you know, tracks. It was like fascinating. Yeah. Like, wow, what a genius. It was like 51, 52, that, that, that little, they were the biggest thing on the planet. They're, those records, they just kept, you know, hitting the charts every two or three months with a new single. And it's like, it, they were really big. And they were making a lot of money. And he was so cheap, he had his, like, he carried his big Ampex deck in the back of the trunk. And he had a little Fender amp. He has a guitar. Their suitcases. They get one hotel room, and they cart the the Ampex up to the hotel room and set it up. You know, and he'd work. He was a workaholic. He'd spend days without sleeping. You know, just he'd work in the hotel room. There's pictures of him working in the kitchen at home. You know, like when she's got a microphone over the sink, <laughs> and she's standing there washing dishes. You know, there's this microphone hanging down. You know, and it's like wow. You know. That was after, I think they did that when they had tape, yeah. But um, what a guy. But when he was doing those lathe recordings, he had to plan the first track to the last track, what was going to be loudest and what was going to be, you know, had to figure all that stuff out, trial and error and, you know, untold hours. And then when he came up with the idea for the multi-track thing on his Ampex machine, he had the Ampex tape machine, he kept tinkering with it, He's like, oh, this is going to be easy. So he goes, has lunch with the guy at Ampex and had a, a paper napkin and a pen. And he drew how he wanted the heads made on a piece, on a napkin. Here, do that for me. I need this. And that was the first multi-track machine. And when he started doing that, um, you know, all these guys Call him Bing Crosby was one of his clients who'd come over and make records so he could sing harmony with himself. You know, and uh, one of those other singers, I think he had her over, Patty Page, one of those kind of people. I don't remember which one it was. K Star, Patty, Patty Page, somebody like that, made a record where they sang harmony with themselves, which is a novelty.